So as much as I'm delighted to welcome you to NSLA's hometown of Baltimore, I am especially honored to be able to introduce its mayor, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Mayor Rawlings-Blake was sworn in as Baltimore's 49th mayor on February 4th, 2010. In November of 2011, she was elected to her first full term as mayor, garnering 87% of the vote in the mayoral general election. Mayor Rawlings-Blake has focused her administration on growing Baltimore's population by 10,000 families over the next decade and by improving public safety, public education, and strengthening our neighborhoods. Just this past June, Mayor Rawlings-Blake became the 73rd president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. She serves on the Board of Trustees and in key leadership positions. She was also elected to a top leadership position in the Democratic National Committee to serve as secretary following the historic re-election of President Barack Obama. She has been honored with numerous awards and recognitions, um, too many for me to list all of them, but in 2013 she was awarded the First Citizen Award by the Maryland State Senate. She is a member of Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Epsilon Omega Chapter, and has served on numerous boards and commissions here in Baltimore, including the Baltimore Convention and Tourism Board, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the National Aquarium, the Living Classrooms Foundation, and the Parks and People Foundation. As a mom of a beautiful daughter, Sophia, Mayor Rawlings-Blake knows firsthand the importance of keeping kids learning all year long. I am happy to present to you Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Good morning, everyone. Very, very pleased to be here with you. I am grateful that you are in my hometown, and hopefully the weather will, uh, you know, cooperate with you. The, the Ravens have not cooperated with me lately, but hopefully the weather will cooperate with you. I'm still not over it on Sunday for anybody who's from Baltimore here. I want to uh, thank uh, Sarah for your kind introduction, and I want to thank our hometown National Summer Learning Association for finally bringing your national conference here to Baltimore. I want to welcome you all to our city. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, there could uh, be no better time for you to meet here in Baltimore, so I'm very grateful that you've chosen to be here. As many of you know, and as Sarah mentioned, Baltimore, uh, NSLA has deep roots here in Baltimore. I recall back in the early 1990s, about the time when I was first elected to the city council, there was a Hopkins undergraduate named uh, Matthew Belay who launched an effort to recruit college undergraduates to teach summer classes in our city schools. And just as you heard, that was called Teach Baltimore. And at that time, uh, and at that time, eventually became one of the larger direct service providers across a number of city elementary schools. From those very humble beginnings emerged today's National Summer Learning Association. I want to thank Matthew and acknowledge him for his early vision in making a difference in our children. The National Summer Learning Association's powerful advocacy is helping to shape how school systems, states, and our nation think about summer for our children. We know that summer is not a time when we can afford to let children sit idly without being engaged in activity. In fact, the research shows that when children, when we allow our children to sit idly, when they experience summer slide, that really sets them on a path. It changes their trajectory and we know that we are not allowing our young people to reach their fullest potential. We owe them that. We know that the activity has to be in the classroom, but it also has to go far beyond the traditional uh, classroom. During the summer, there are a variety of other ways we can create opportunities and challenge our young people. For example, the Youth Works program operated by our Mayor's Office of Employment Development creates summer jobs, structured summer job opportunities for young people. Yes, they are uh, opportunities for young people to earn a paycheck, but they also learn about financial literacy, they learn about work ethic, and we certainly make sure that they learn the soft skills that they need to be successful in life. The, um, in the past years, we've typically aimed for about 5,000 positions for our young people, but this past summer, in the wake of an unrest that really uh, and truly shook our city, and at a time where we need it, needed it the most, we increased that number by more than 50%, creating 8,000 summer job placement openings for Baltimore City's young people, enough for every young person who completed an application. 
It required a lot of hard work. Our city, our government, our not-for-profits, our foundations, our private sector partners, all of us working together. Uh, and as I visited the different job places and south sites this summer, I saw firsthand the difference it made for our young people. You know, when you see so much of the young people that are they're getting attention, uh, they're getting attention uh, not necessarily for the, most po for the most positive things, but when I visited those sites, I got to visit some uh, young people. I remember at one of our local hospitals in, a, um, a, in the, re the hand rehabilitation center in one of our hospitals, a young, uh, young student, and every single person that had an opportunity to work with them could not say enough about what a kind person he was, how he showed up to work early every single day, ready to work with a helpful spirit. And every time I heard that compliment from one of his supervisors or even the patients that were sitting by, I could see him filling up with pride. That pride that comes from knowing that you have something to give to this world and people see it. People acknowledge that. That's what these summer opportunities are about. It's more than just a paycheck every two weeks. It's, it's allowing our young people to see, yes, they have it within them to make a difference in this world. And I know that the National Summer Learning Association has also identified uh, childhood nutrition as a major concern in the summertime. We see that far too often in Baltimore, where there's so much food. There's food deserts, there's food insecurity. Uh, this has been a priority of, my, of mine, personally in, in my administration. I want to make sure that Baltimore's children spend their time in the summer having fun, learning, and not worrying about where their next meal is going to come from. Across the city, we've worked to ensure that our different agencies operate summer meal sites, ensuring that children receive the nutrition that they need every day during the summer. We've been very, very aggressive in these efforts, looking for new partners, whether it's libraries or churches or other summer programs, our su summer programming partners. And we've been able to expand uh, access to food in the summer. Of course, there's much more that we're doing to promote uh, summer learning uh, in Baltimore. And I look forward to sharing some of those details in our upcoming conversation. Again, uh, I've seen firsthand what happens when we come together with a unified spirit in efforts to support our young people, whether it's expanding access to meals uh, during the school year or during the summer, or whether it's expanding summer opportunities, job opportunities for our kids. When we come together across sectors with a unified spirit, we get things done and we make a difference in the lives of our young people. I want to uh, thank everyone again uh, for being here, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking a bit more about uh, what we're doing with uh, summer learning, and I want to uh, thank our sponsor, uh, Comcast, for, I see Donna out there somewhere, thank you very much uh, for uh, sponsoring this event and being a good partner uh, here in Baltimore. Again, thank you for the opportunity, and I think we're going to move into the panel discuss discussion, so I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you very much, and welcome to Baltimore. Thank you, Mayor Rawlings-Blake. We're looking forward to hearing more, like she said, in just a few minutes. In the meantime, I want to welcome um, our, our next presenters to the stage, um, Bella Shaw Spooner of the National League of Cities and Virginia B. Edwards, our moderator for our Cities at the Center of Summer Learning Discussion. Virginia B. Edwards has been the president of Editorial Projects and Education, the $16 million a year nonprofit corporation that publishes Education Week and edweek.org since 1997. Ginny has been the educator, ed editor in chief of Education Week, the, edu the nation's premier newspaper of record for pre K to 12 education since 1989. Before joining EPE, Ginny worked for two years at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and for nearly 10 years before that, was an editor and reporter at the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky. We are thrilled to have Ginny and Bella and Mayor Rawlings Blake with us, so I will turn it over to Ginny to get us started. Good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank the National Summer Learning Association for inviting me to participate in this great conference. So as you've already heard, I've been the editor of Education Week for 26 years. And at the risk of sounding a wee bit full of myself, uh, I think that tenure has given me a pretty good uh, 
perspective on uh, pre-K through 12 education, youth development, and, and where, how we've gotten to where we are today. By definition, as a journalist, I've been a chronicler, a synthesizer, a documenter, and an analyzer of the state of play in pre-collegiate education and the transition that follows, whether in post-secondary education or gainful employment in the workplace. But make no mistake, I am not an a disinterested bystander. I care passionately about the impact of our work, about our work to supply high quality news, information, and data in an effort to stoke demand for better schools and better outcomes for students and the communities they live in. That was a station break. So with that, let me set a few ground rules for this session. As you know, we have a very short time for this session, and I'd like to think we're going to cover off on a lot of ground. So the first time you talk, Bella, you need to introduce yourself. We've already heard Mayor's, uh, Mayor Rawlings Blake's bio, and there's plenty of bio info in the program, so take advantage of that. So I'd like to encourage us, us, us all, and that includes me, to be really, really brief, like only a minute or two each time we speak. Our goal, I, excuse me, both so we can cover off on as many topics as possible and keep the session sprightly. And I apologize to my friends over on the right side of the room. I'm sorry you can't see me. Um, and finally, even as we're going to discuss the challenges and pitfalls facing communities as they work to expand summer learning opportunities for young people and families, our goal, I think, should be to be constructive, concrete, and solution-oriented. Make sense? Okay. Um, so I don't need to tell you all, summer learning loss is real. It takes uh, a vision, it takes leadership, and it takes coordination among many, many attributes to stem that tide. We know that mayors are uh, showing critical leadership on summer learning, a topic that doesn't always have a clear home or owner, but it's increasingly important uh, to conversations about equity, excellence, and opportunity for young people and families in these communities. With oversight over libraries and parks and rec centers and housing authorities, mayors, by definition, have a unique purview to look at the city's assets holistically and to shepherd more uh, efficient distribution of scarce resources across the city during the summer months. Remember, most urban cities are currently serving one, between one quarter and one third of their school population in the summer, with school districts typically serving about 10 to 15 percent of those students. Certainly the challenges are numerous and complicated. Summer funding, which is largely dependent on city and school district budgets, is often episodic. It contracts, it expands widely from year to year, and that creates uncertainty for families and reduces the likelihood of strong habits of participation. There's also little data collected on where and how young people spend their summers, making duplication of effort likely and limiting the ability to track the most effective models. And lastly, and most important, there is a tremendous need, a need for learning opportunities that can be scaled and replicated affordably. So we're going to start right off with my first question, is that there is good news, there is a lot of good news out there. There are cities leading the way with creative solutions. We've already heard the beginnings of some of that um, in Baltimore. So I'm going to ask you both, why are mayors uniquely positioned to lead a systemic approach to summer learning opportunities? Mayor uh, Rawlings Blake? Because mayors get things done. I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was very interested in uh, being in leadership in the Conference of Mayors because I believed uh, that as a country we needed to see elected leaders who understood the, the value, not just of talking about things that we care about, but doing things. And one of the uh, platforms that I talked about when uh, in, a, in my inauguration speech was what if, you know, what if mayors made up their minds that we are going to move the needle on things like infant mortality, teen pregnancy, summer learning, summer meals, things that impact the quality of life for people all over this country. Even if as mayors we all made that commitment to move the needle slightly, we would impact millions of people across this country. 
And summer learning is one of those areas when I th that I think, where I think that we have a lot of work to do and so much opportunity. In the cities, it doesn't matter whether we control the, the school system or not. As mayor, we lead. We have the power to convene. Um, we, can, we can coalesce the private sector, the foundations, not-for-profits, everyone to this, to this effort. And there are countless examples of uh, cities across the country where this is happening and happening successfully. So we have roadmaps of different sized cities, large cities, small cities, mid-sized cities that are making it happen. So I think setting this goal of improving uh, access to, and, and opportunities for, summer, for young people during the summer is a great goal, but it's also a very achievable goal because mayors are, I, I, there's no one better position than mayors to tackle this work. We're gonna take uh, much of what the mayor just said and pull it apart to look at the specific elements of it. But let me give uh, Bella a chance to introduce herself and uh, respond to this idea of why are mayors in such a key position to be able to do this work. Sure, great. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, so I'm Bella Schaas-Booner, I'm Program Manager uh, for After School Initiatives at the National League of Cities. Um, we have a special Institute for Youth Education and Families um, and a strong body of work around after school and summer learning. And Audrey Hutchinson is our Director of Education Expanded Learning. Been doing this work for 15 years, um, deeply rooted in the after school system building work um, with many, many cities across the country. And as Mayor Rollings Blake said, mayors are critical and are taking a lead on this work. Um, we're new in a way to the summer learning space, though a lot of our after school cities are also, of course, um, investing in summer learning as well. So we're delighted to have um, a strong partnership with the National Summer Learning Association to really dig in to the summer learning issue and looking at how cities are dealing with this issue and how their leadership is really stepping up to address, um, address the issue. So of course, to echo Mayor Rawlings-Blake, mayors across the country really are stepping up. Um, we've definitely seen a trend. I think the trend is you know, continuing to go up in terms of the number of cities that are stepping forward and recognizing that summer is a unique space. There's a niche there for cities to get involved in, um, accessing all of the city agencies that they have um, oversight over, um, as well as that convening authority that she spoke about to bring people together and talk about how can we make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a lot of movement at the local level. I know we haven't seen much, um, as much as we'd want at the federal level. And I know the statewide after school networks um, funded by the Mott Foundation are um, really pushing at the state level as well. But cities are really where we're seeing things happening. Local investments, um, as well as bringing in philanthropic dollars and partnerships with school districts to really address um, the summer learning gap. So how do you come up, Mayor, with your shared vision uh, at the, in the city? You have the power to convene, you said, and then how do you uh, work to come to that place where everybody's in and pulling with, you know, their oars are going in the same direction? I, I think the, the vision was already there. I mean, whether it's in Baltimore or in cities across the country, this work around summer learning is happening. So for me, when I talk about the power to convene, that is pulling together that shared vision because too many people are doing this work for us not to do it together. And whether, I think uh, this, that, that um, realization came years ago for early childhood education where people realized, oh, wait a minute, we're all doing this stuff and let's convene. And I think that the, the federal support for uh, early childhood education, the, the uh, greater support for that, is evidence of you know that work that convening happening uh, earlier, but I think that work this work is happening all over the all over the country, and it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's what's just pulling the, the people what's together. the number one lesson you've learned? Because beyond shared vision, there's the need for coordination, right? Mm -hmm. There's the as you said, the real work, not mm -hmm. just the blah 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 up here. Mm -hmm. So how do you? What's the number one? Um, lesson you've learned in how to ensure best coordination among these stakeholders? I think making some people responsible for that coordination yeah. and tracking and I have we have our partners from the Family League out here somewhere there we go and uh, Jonathan has been a great partner in helping us you know what happened when I first got on the council was there was no real coordination any person that wanted the city to fund a program you know they'd show up and you know 
some people got funded, some people didn't. There was no real rhyme or reason as far as, you know, are we looking at the effectiveness of the program, the area, the catchment area, none of that was happening. And I was very focused on, look, we, have, we, we don't get to spend these dollars twice. We have to make sure that we're serving, we're using the dollars that we have the most effective and efficient way possible. So the Family League has been a great partner in helping us to be accountable for how we're spending these money, the, these uh, money. So if, if I would say that was one of the best things that we did because we're able to say, okay, we're serving this amount of, um, you know, this amount of kids, um, you know, and this is what we're getting for the funding. So having some sort of accountability measure helps because it also helps to support, to give the foundation for greater financial support. When people, whether it's a foundation or private sector, is looking yeah. to support something, they need to see a track record and that has to be reliable. Yeah. Bella, how about um, what you're seeing across communities in terms of governance structures or ways to do that coordination? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's critical. I think you mentioned in your opening remarks about how this work doesn't have a home, and I agree. When cities that have created structures, we've seen a lot of new um, summer learning councils or task forces, subcommittees within city councils that are focusing on summer learning, um, identifying an intermediary or a coordinating entity in the community, a nonprofit or a United Way, to own that work so that there is a place to follow up with stakeholders to bring those folks together. Um, that's where we've really seen this work take off. So um, thinking about what kind of structures you can create in your community, speaking to your mayor about really owning that work and taking leadership to create some kind of body that um, people can start with. It's really just kind of a catalyze, catalyzing effect um, so that there is a place to own the work and um, start thinking about those investments and looking at the needs assessments across your community. Um, because we know in so many communities, summer learning is happening, but often it's very fragmented, um, just in the way after school is. Um, you know, we work with the Wallace Foundation to share knowledge at, from their knowledge center and lots of our resources um, about the coordination of um, after school systems in cities and summers are really following the same pattern. Um, that you need some entity to lead the way um, that's responsible for tracking the work. So I was thinking about accountability as a very specific issue that folks here might be interested in hearing more about what it looks like on the ground, different from maybe what they're using in their own communities. What mm -hmm. are one or two accountability uh, approaches that you've seen um, make a difference in really bringing energy to the work so people you know, transparency would be part of it, right? Being mm -hmm. able to say, here's, the, here's what the data show about the trajectory of kids or families in the community. I don't know if your work, you think specifically about accountability and what good structures look like. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, especially in places where there are um, public dollars going to support this work that are coming through voter propositions. So Sarah mentioned the new money coming out of San Francisco. Um, there's new um, marijuana tax money, revenue money in Denver, and we have friends from Denver who will speak about that at a workshop later this afternoon. But you know, in Fort Worth, Texas, they have a crime tax that's um, really bringing in public dollars to support um, intervention prevention, and so it's for um, additional law enforcement, but it's also for after school and summer. So when you have public. sort of public accountability, yeah. even more so, you know, you really need to track the data and see how uh, much of an impact the summer programs are having. Mayor, do you want to speak a little more about how that plays out in real time in Baltimore? It happens in real time when you commit to working together, and that's more than uh, doing that in theory, but in practice. Right. And I say that because the mayor's office and the, the Fund for Educational Excellence work together to convene all of the uh, summer funders uh, and providers every month to do this coordination work. And that, you know, that regular convening, that's where the, you know, that's where the, the I accountable guess the, to each other. accountable to each other, but it's also where the, I guess the, the sausage is made. You know, people have to, in, the, in, that, in that space, and when you make the commitment to re meet on a regular basis, it is. It's, it's, you know, looking people across the table yeah. and holding each other accountable, as well as, you know, with the, the, the spirit that I mentioned before when I was uh, uh, talking about, look, we are all in this together. You know, where, where are the gaps? Who can we, who can fill those gaps? Where are there, is, you know, the, is there an excess of service somewhere else? Is there a service provider that we need to cut loose? I mean, all of those conversations can happen 
if you, you know, make that regular com that commitment to regularly convene for that accountability. And what do you think the role of communications and public awareness is in that equation? I think communications and public awareness is key. I mean, it frustrates me to no end when I hear people say, well, there's nothing out there. You know, there's nothing out and, and I often say, well, did you look on the website? Did you call, you know, we have the 211 for public service. No, I'm like, well, exactly how is it that you're supposed to figure that out, right? So it gets frustrating and we, sometimes you can get frustrated into inaction and then sometimes frustration gets you to mm -hmm. do things another way. So we did spend some time, we have spent time and we continue to work on it, having a central location for all uh, summer opportunities. So we have a website, so whether it's uh, funded by the city or uh, not-for-profit or whatever, schools, everybody, uh, we have a, a central location for all of these opportunities and we, really try to make people aware of it as much as possible. And I continue to look for ways. I mean, when, um, when, I, can, when I hear again, you know, I spent a lot of time, particularly this summer, you know, on the ground, grassroots, talking to people, and I would hear that. And I would say, listen, I'll tell you all the different things that we did to try to get the word out. Clearly, it's not enough. If you have an idea or a way that we should be communicating this message, let me know so we can improve our communication to get to who we're trying to serve, because you know, it, frustration is one thing, action is another thing. So we're we've continued to look. I continue to challenge myself and my team to look for uh, new and more impactful ways to uh, communicate with the the people that need our services the most. Is that one of the things you all work on when you come together on a monthly way? Is how to elevate the? Profile? I know that they do, but this is. I mean, this is. Yes, they, yeah. uh, yes, and that's why the, 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 the website and everything got yeah. together, but this is, for me, this is a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. This is, all right, we have these structures that are set up, what's left? Yeah. You know, what other work can be done? How can we push even further to make sure that we're um, connecting with people? Bella, how are communities finding, figuring out what the demand is for these kinds of services? That, to me, seems like part of the continuum. Understanding the demand is, related to also building awareness and then communicating opportunities. Right, right absolutely. You know, I think that's where um, a lot of work can be done as well. I think that re that's where there's an opportunity. Um, there clearly are waiting lists. You know, we know a lot of young people, you know, don't have safe places to go, don't have enriching experiences in the summer. Um, and that needs to be brought forth even more clearly. Um, you can see kids hanging out, you know, that may be an indication. Obviously, you know, crime rates are an indication. Um, and you know the academic achievement piece. So I think cities are really partnering, mayors are partnering with their school districts to understand this better, um, having the community rise up and talk about the need. Um, I think it's been great. The After School Alliance just released, you know, information about these gaps and NSLA, um, of course. And so it's really important to make sure that communities know about it, um, and then also to um, put the information out there, as Mayor Rowling Flake said. You know, so a lot of cities are creating program locators um, to identify where those programs are. Um, and the process is so key to reaching out to summer learning programs, finding out you know, what's available, finding out what the waiting lists look like, um, and mapping that all out so that stakeholders who may have a little bit of pushback to that can see that there are huge gaps, and where are those gaps in a community? Are they in this part of town? Are they here? You know, people may have heard of all the big, you know, Boys and Girls Club or YMCA programs, but where are they, and who are they serving? So, so that it becomes really apparent. Do you have a community or two you could point us to that you think has done a particularly good job of elevating the profile of these opportunities and engaging public parents and young people in these? Opportunities. And don't feel compelled sure. to yeah. take Baltimore. Baltimore, Baltimore first. Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great job. Yes, no. absolutely, absolutely. No, we applied your leadership for sure. Um, but um, Mayor Warren in Rochester, New York, um, she has done a great job as well, certainly taking leadership to promote the issue of summer learning loss and curbing that, um, initiated a three to three campaign. Um, to focus on the young kids, but also reading by third grade and reallocating city resources to ensure Good. that that's there. Um, but program located in smaller communities too, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, um, Decatur, Georgia, um, Denver's done a great job around that mapping, Nashville. Um, so there's been a lot of cities that have taken that approach to mapping it and um, 
working with parents to understand the value of summer programs um, and certainly with the school districts as well. You know, one of the things I can say, not to suck up to this audience, but this community has done a wonderful job, I think, of sharing with each other, more so than I would say the kind of traditional public sis school system who, you know, they get so into their own local communities, there's not quite as much sharing as I see in the out-of-school community space. So that's great. So what, a, what do you, uh, Bella, think um, the number one need is with respect to some of the, it, the communities need to address with respect to basic needs of nutrition? And, um, uh, and Mayor, you had uh, raised these as, w as well. If you could wave a wand or if you could do something today different from how it's being done, what needs to be addressed to address these basic needs? Well, certainly the hunger and nutrition part is key, and summer and summer meals really do fill that gap. And more and more cities are stepping up and understanding that they can tap those federal resources to draw down those dollars to provide summer meals. Um, we have uh, a lot of cities that are doing that through a particular initiative, and of course through the First Ladies Let's Move initiative, one of the goals is increasing access to summer meals as well. So I think um, cities understanding that there is an opportunity there um, and bringing in the young people for meals is an opportunity for them to do additional programming and to raise the quality of that programming so kids stay um, and not only you know are fed but are also engaged in activity. Um, so that's one, certainly on basic needs. And on the safety piece, of course, um, that is a primary issue for cities to get involved in this um, in this work. But really to my surprise, we just issued a, a survey around summer learning and we had over 300 responses. And I would have expected for the reason why cities are engaged in summer learning was for public safety. And though that was high on the list, the highest one was to address academic achievement. So I think broadly communities are understanding that the connection between increased academic achievement and just stronger cities overall and needing to have an educated workforce for kids to stay in their communities and be able to obtain jobs because they have the skills and having those opportunities in the summer help them get there. Mayor, you had already um, spoken, you've already spoken about summer youth employment and the importance of that. Um, what is the, I don't know, most um, impactful thing you've been able to do from your perch as mayor to affect that? And I heard you say, of course, 8,000 mm -hmm. uh, positions, but beyond just the positions. Beyond the positions, one of the things that I've been proud about uh, being able to introduce to Baltimore is the private sector component to our youth employment. Uh, previous to my administration, the focus of the summer youth opportunity had been on public sector work, which is definitely important, particularly for our younger people. But creating the Hire One Youth Initiative that asked the business community to do uh, something very simple, just hire one young person, I think has been uh, tremendously helpful because at every point where we can engage our uh, private sector in the city in supporting our young people, we create an opportunity to expand that support. So yes, we get them interested on the, um, the summer jobs, but then we also have a contact place to get them to talk about mentoring, to talk about our reading by three and how we can engage their workforce in these opportunities. So I think that the, I would say most impactful in that space would be the, the Hire One Youth Initiative, that we continue to press every single year to uh, expand and expand and expand. So do you worry about uh, here today, gone tomorrow kind of aspect of this kind of work, depending who's in power, depending on the funding streams, depending on kind of the buy-in from the community? It, it can feel um, not sustainable at times, that it's, it's working in the moment. Anyway, address what you think about that I issue. Do, I do think about it. I mean, um, a month and two days ago, I announced that I wasn't seeking uh, re-election and it, it uh, makes you think long and hard about the things that you put in place and what I can do in this next year and, and some change to ensure that the progress that we make, um, that we don't lose that progress and that the programs that we're putting in place have a life of, uh, of their own and they're not dependent on me. So I'm, I'm very, um, you know, we're working on keeping some leadership in place for the, for example, the Hire One Youth Initiative, so uh, you know that the business community feels some continuity, and, and um, you know hopefully we can continue to take advantage of the momentum uh, that we've seen around summer meals. The the, the the work that 
I talked about with communicating this differently and uh, trying to dig deeper into the community, that's, I think, going to be helpful in that work because once you get a partner on board with summer learning and they see it, I mean, summer uh, meals, and they, they see its impact, then you know, we, can, we can get that to stick. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited to, to see the summer meals expand so much with mm -hmm. new partners uh, this summer, and we're gonna continue uh, that work. So yes, it's, it is definitely a concern of mine, um, and that's why I think that the collaborative work is so important. So, uh, you know, these collaborations exist regardless of who is uh, leading the city, and hopefully they'll be strong enough to. Are there avoid. systems or governance or policy changes that can make this more formalized? You know, that's what we're looking at. Yeah. You know, any, any yeah, suggestions I'll, have, I'll take? Have them. at it. That's <laughs> what I'm. Uh, well, I think some of the sustainable funding sources that have been created in communities, um, you know, at the city level, in terms of public funding, there's voter approved, you know, bonds that are passing, um, has been wonderful. Obviously, we love to have a dedicated funding stream in all communities for this, and that's not the case. Um, but I think so much of it is around the messaging, right? And thinking about, you know, what is the focus of a mayor? You know, what is their particular um, passion? And how can you align summer learning with that? Um, so that's for the, you know, the particular leaders in power at the time, but I also agree that these collaborative structures are, are so critical. Um, being able to identify and just make the case for whether it's for STEM in summer, and I feel like that's a really easy case to make. We know the data around you know, how many more young people we need skilled in those areas um, to appeal to the business community, um, to get someone who's not so political um, also behind it, you know, and of course when you have the mayor and the superintendent and the, you know, community person or private sector person, you know, that's a very strong collaborative, you know, having your police chief there too. Um, but it does feel like it's kind of a constant, you know, knocking at the door to let people understand the power of this work. But once you have a successful program and you have the data to document impact, you got to get that data out and make sure people really understand. So this has been something of a lightning round. We're going to um, be able to take a few questions. So if you would come to the mics, uh, questions for either of these two fine ladies, uh, please step up um, and I'll call on you. Um, let me um, throw the question. I'm particularly interested, Mayor, you talked about the soft skills, non-cognitive, there's not really a good word for those skills, we know that. Social, um, social emotional learning, right? I like to talk about student engagement or the engagement of young people and motivation of young people. I mean, how do you think about that in the context of uh, summer programs and being, you know, not just um, kind of, uh, you know, go along and get along kind of programs, but really thinking about what will engage young people and, and move them along, whether in academic or just in kind of engagement kind of ways. I think that's a, it's, it's a tough question. And I tried it to, um, to reach that answer through uh, conversations. I have a, another um, a youth focused uh, uh, forum uh, like town hall either this evening or tomorrow uh, because you know it it's about being in relationship and trying to open those uh, the channels of yeah. communication and it's tough particularly with young people because sometimes they don't know what the hell they want you know they say that you know we want to be we want to be heard right and you ask them okay well who's not hearing you and what does what what do you want to say and and how can i help you to be heard and they're like i don't know well you know then i can't you know then what can we do so that what i do is to say just you know to continue to to give um our young people opportunities you know to 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 be present to be engaged and to have those conversations and hopefully by doing it you know enough times without really having an agenda you know when we have these forums it's uh it's like it's kind of you know like this you know we talk say what you want and hopefully by doing that enough times we'll give that, them that space that they need to um you know to, to feel that somebody's listening yeah how about bella do you have anything you'd like to add to this engaging young people in authentic kinds of experiences mm -hmm. sure yeah, I mean, I think the focus groups and just having the space for young people to voice it is really important. Um, we've had, there are a lot of mayors, and I'm sure you too, you know, go out into schools and talk to young people and just being very visible and present um, about how important young people are 
to lead the leaders in that community and um, really communicating to the youth that you do want to hear you know, about what, what their interests are and then putting that into action and creating programs that really do respond to their needs. I see people okay. on the mic, though. What we're gonna do, I see four people. We're gonna hear all your questions. You guys write, I will, right oh, I don't down. have yeah, a pen. Yeah, There's I a problem with having And then we'll, we'll answer them kind of in the aggregate so we get them all in. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. You first and say who you are, yes. please. Um, good morning. My name is Candace Obadina. I'm a program director in Memphis of the Summer Learning Organization. And my question is, as a program director that works with a collaborative network in our city that is focused on the cradle to career pipeline, what can I do to push the needle for our city government? I love our city and I like what I'm hearing on the stage and I just want to, with a newly elected <laughs> mayor, ensure that um, our work continues. Good, great. We're gonna come back to it um, oh, okay. in the back. Uh, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Mike Toombs. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, organization called uh, KUMC. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, highly performing young people as well as uh, we're involved with a NOVA program in Kansas City with the mayor there. Um, wondering if you have uh, noticed any developing interest in working with uh, at-risk or gangs in the summer. Uh, something you mentioned earlier about them getting jobs does make a huge difference. Uh, we had 50 young people, uh, 13 to uh, 17 this summer. Uh, working uh, all gang members, and they uh, did very well. We managed to keep uh, 35 of them involved for 12 weeks in our program, mainly because they were being paid, uh, but the program had ARC integrated uh, curriculum. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to provide those kind of opportunities to our young people, uh, even though it may seem they're lost. Uh, I think when you give them a job and show them uh, alternatives, uh, they will rise to the occasion. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are you, uh, okay, we've got two for, and you each can answer either one or both. The idea of even getting the work more embedded into the city government is partly what I, oh, we got one more. Let's do it before we start answering. So Your, my question is, my name is Robert Bridgman. I'm from uh, the Phyllis Brooks House in Cambridge, part of um, Harvard University. <clears throat> My question is, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, one of the things I get concerned about is that as a country, we have a tendency to want to push the summer learning loss, which I totally agree with. But I also get concerned that as we push the summer learning loss and become take our young people to become young adults too quickly, that how do we prevent <clears throat> from pushing them so hard that they become, they lose the child and become the young adult mm -hmm. before their time. Nice. I, you please jump in. Take a, take a stab at with the, with the pushing them to be um, adults too quickly, I think the answer to that is to make sure that in your work for summer learning that there's diversity. So uh, we have summer learning in our rec programs, but they're, the focus of our, we had I think 31 uh, rec centers that have free camps this summer. There was a learning component, but most of it was fun. Most of it was a way for us to make sure that we had a free place for kids to be safe, to be engaged, and we knew that they were gonna eat that day, and they would be, that they would be healthy. But when you, uh, when you have a diversity of offering, then you, know, you can empower parents to pick what's right for their kids. Some kids need to be pushed. Some kids need that additional structure, and some don't. And when you have it, whether it was with the, we had like aquatic camps, like, you know, fun camps, we had the, the more structured learning, but you have to make sure that you have those options on the table and, and work it so that the, the parents can choose the best way to make sure that their kids aren't growing up too fast. Um, with the, the issue of, um, you know, Candace mentioned about how do you make sure that the work continues, I would use the organizations that are represented on this table, National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors. There are uh, staff in, in both organizations that are responsible for this work across the country, and they can help you. Uh, and the, the, uh, the organizations in um, Memphis to ensure that that work 
continues and, and can give assistance, you know, to give ideas on how, what that looks like, how they can, um, the, the staff can help support uh, the organization because the, the staff at both of our organizations want to see this work continue. They don't, even with the change in um, uh, leadership and with the programs around uh, gangs, yeah, I definitely think that the gentleman that spoke uh, from Kansas City, you know, he's, he's hitting on a topic that definitely, um, I, I feel like in Baltimore needs more work. Um, we do a lot around what we're calling disconnected youth, but doesn't have a gang focus. Uh, and I think that um, this past year, uh, you know, meeting with gang members, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to create pathways for those young people who many have given up on to find their way back into society. Um, you know, that's certainly something that I know we need to, to do more work on here in Baltimore. And I think um, as that work, whether it's in Kansas City or other places across the country, um, as we start to look at best practices, so we're not just all spitballing, trying to figure out how to make it work, I think it'll be helpful, uh, you know, it will be helpful to Baltimore and I think it'll certainly be helpful to helping us to recapture um, that population uh, nationwide. Stella, any or all of the questions you've got, one minute. One minute, sure. <laughs> I'll follow up with you later. No, um, absolutely. So in Memphis, we have strong relationships there. You know, we know there's a new mayor. Um, we would love to follow up, I don't know where she is, um, love to follow up with you um, around that, you know, in terms of the messaging to the new mayor about this, the issue and kind of understanding what else is already happening in the community. Um, there's also a Tennessee um, after school network that focuses on summer too, and so we want to pull on the state resources as well. Um, and to our Kansas City friends, um, you know, Mayor um, James there has made a huge investment in um, summer learning and after school too, so we are delighted to, help, you know, kind of help think about that. Um, and for the gang piece, you know, we also have a lot of work in the National League of Cities and our institute around um, opportunity youth, disconnected youth. We have a gang prevention network as well. So there are some lessons there that we can pull out from to share with you about how communities have engaged, um, you know, gang members, people formerly in gangs to um, engage them in the summer space and what has been most effective. Um, I'll just say really quickly as well, um, with the support of the Wallace Foundation and the Mott Foundation, we have just selected um, seven new states to host mayoral summits on um, after school and summer learning. So Kansas and Missouri um, are one of those states um, as well, as I should say quickly, Massachusetts, Indiana, um, Alabama, Florida, Ohio. Buckeyes, I hear Buckeyes are involved. Um, so if there are communities from those states here, um, I'd love to talk with you. It's going to be an opportunity over the next year um, and having a culminating event next year to really bring city leaders across those states together to talk about the importance of this work. So um, we will be a resource to you. I want to put one, two cents in that um, some of the most important work I feel like I've pursued in my career, even going back to the Carnegie Foundation, is the notion of the need youth have to feel like they belong and feel like a part of a community that feel like adults care about them. And so I, I have a very much a youth development kind of frame to the way I think about my work even within a more uh, formal education context. So I love hearing this and the questions were right on that. Would you join me in thanking our panelists? Thank you so much to Ginny and to our panelists. Um, I want to invite up from Comcast Donna Ratley Washington, who's the Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Comcast Beltway Region. She's here to share a little bit more about Comcast's work uh, to support communities. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mayor, for your kind words and this wonderful panel. It uh, was very enlightening uh, for me, as I, I know it was for everyone here. Well, good morning. Um, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Comcast to support uh, this wonderful work that you all do uh, for summer learning, summer all, uh, all day learning, right, uh, after school and during the summer. At Comcast, uh, being a part of the community, supporting the community, trying to create positive change is really something uh, that's in our DNA that we do every day. And here in Baltimore, uh, where we provide service and, and work with the mayor, 
uh, as she said, it's a real priority of her administration to make sure that the corporate and business communities are, are being a part of the community and using our resources from our economic resources, from our people resources to support uh, the community and the efforts that she's leading. So we thank you and applaud you for your work in making us do our jobs, right? So, you know, Comcast, we really, our giving that we do around the country and here in Baltimore and in all of your communities is really focused on three areas. Uh, youth, leadership development, digital literacy, and volunteerism. And we, we do that in a variety of ways. Um, one way is through scholarship programs. We have a program called uh, Comcast Leaders and Achievers. I hope you that work uh, directly in schools know about it. Uh, we provide a $1,000 scholarship uh, to every high school. We ask high school gui guidance counselors to identify not just the best and the brightest, the ones that are going to get the, the scholarship awards, but those, are that, those students that are committed to community service. In addition, we provide one $10,000 scholarship per market to every um, uh, Le Comcast Leaders and Achievers scholarship. So if you don't know about that, please stop by our, de our booth outside and get some more information uh, about it because it's a wonderful opportunity. Digital literacy, uh, we, you know, that this is our, our product line, we recognize the importance of digital literacy and not just uh, what the technology, using the technology, but what it can really do uh, for kids and for their families. So we partner with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, our program there is called My Dot Future. It's a technology, uh, cutting edge technology education program really designed to open kids to the uh, power of what technology can do for them. So it's very cool stuff that I know you all will know about. In My Dot Future, they can record and edit their own music and videos, learn coding. Who doesn't want to do that? Game design and robotics, all the digital skills that can get them on the path to 21st century career options. But the real reason I'm here today, and I think uh, the greatest synergy with all of your work uh, is Internet Essentials. Internet Essentials is our number one community uh, investment program. And if you haven't heard about it, now's your opportunity. It's the largest, and I, can, I say this with a lot of pride, it is the largest uh, broadband adoption program in the country today. Uh, so far, we've, this is our, we're in our fourth year, we've connected over two million uh, Americans to the internet through Internet Essentials. That's over 500,000 families. And, you know, it's hard to believe, you know, all of you, you're so connected. I see all the uh, booths out there, all the online resources. It's hard to believe that 30% of Americans, and, you know, we, we know the correlation, it's low-income Americans still do not have the Internet in their home. And it's especially hard to believe that a young person, K through 12, uh, would not have that resource in their home, but it's true. And it's not because, you know, our little Comcast service is not running down the street or, or another provider. Uh, the technology is there. Unfortunately, families are still not understanding the importance of having the Internet in their home or they're thinking they can't afford it. So our program was really designed to address those barriers. For families that qualify for the National School Lunch Program, they can qualify for Internet Essentials. And through that, they can get low-cost broadband, $9.95 a month, less than $120 a year. They can purchase a full-service, Internet-ready computer for less than $150. And there are multiple options for online digital literacy training. We partner here in Baltimore City with the Enoch Pratt Free Library. We're offering over 60 uh, sponsored uh, sessions that we do, $500 a, a session, but free to the public uh, at Enoch Pratt and around the country we offer these resources. The way we get the word out is through organizations like the National Summer Learning Conference through your work as educators, through your work as nonprofit leaders, helping kids stay online. You know, I'm a mother of three like the mayor, uh, the mayor's daughter, I believe is 11 as well. And 
you know, I know. She just turned 12. She just turned 12. She's, my son turns 12 on November 1st. But, you know, and I know my kids are not the target audience, right? My kids have resources. But I also know about the brain drain, you know, after school and during the summer that they experience. All of you, I mean, the work you're doing is so key. And Internet Essentials is such a key link that can help families access uh, those resources after school and online uh, and during the summer. You know, my little privileged boy was just told, you know, his reading's not up to speed. What was the first thing they told us to do? Go online and go online and use a program called Reading Assistant. An amazing, amazing resource, right? That he can do at night on the weekends because we have internet in our home. Well, I ask you to you know stop by our booth out front, uh, take a pamphlet, learn about it, go online www.internetessentials.com. We will provide you with more collateral than you ever thought possible, uh, completely free of charge. You can, buy, you can order thousands of brochures, flyers, posters to make this opportunity uh, known to families, um, again, that qualify for the National School Lunch Program. So thank you, Sarah. This, was, this is an amazing conference. Um, I applaud the work you do every day, and I uh, ask that if you take a moment to stop by our booth outside. Thank you very much.